Thank you. <laughs> well, um, I'm thrilled to be kicking off Fortune Brainstorm Tech with Hans Vesberg, Me the too. CEO of Ericsson, not Sony Ericsson. No, Ericsson. 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 Keep it simple. Um, Hans is uh, the CEO, has been CEO since 2010, but has been with Ericsson for a very long time, um, since 1991, yeah. and served in several different roles, including CFO, right before uh, becoming CEO. Um, he's also chairman of the Swedish Handball Association, is that right? Absolutely. And correct. comes from a very long line of police officers. This is the first in his family not to be a police officer, actually. So we'll talk all about Swedish crime novels <laughs> at the end. Somebody has to ask that question. Um, you might be wondering why we're kicking off the conference with Ericsson, not Facebook or Airbnb or an Uber, for example. Um, but one of the things that all those companies have in common is the need to reach users, more users, on mobile devices across the globe, not just here in the US. Um, and that's probably something that Ericsson knows a thing or two about. So my first question to you, Hans, is why should the Facebooks of the world work with you? And how can they work with you? Uh, you need to look a little bit back. I mean, Ericsson founded 1876. And basically, we're building networks all around the world since 1876. Uh, today, we're in 180 countries. We, we build networks all around the world. Of course, we know a lot about how applications, services are working on top of the network and what is needed in order to optimize them. And uh, as much of the growth and the connectivity will come in very many places all around the world, it is an obvious discussion that we are having with many of the internet companies, uh, but also other industries, because finally we are in a technology revolution where uh, mobility, broadband, and the cloud will actually transform a lot of things that we have around us. And uh, therefore, we are engaging with many different stakeholders every day. So, so tell us specifically about Facebook, because that was a recent announcement. You're launching some kind of a, a, an innovation lab yep. in conjunction with Facebook. What, what is that exactly, and how did it come about? Several reasons. I mean, one is uh, that we, as I said, have been building networks uh, for a long, long time in 180 countries. And, and of course, one thing is that the internet.org, which was an initiative of Facebook where we joined, is actually addressing to build even more networks to get even more people connected in the world. And of course, that combination between us and them were important because we have the global scale. But I think more important is that one need to realize that not everyone has 4G in the world. I mean, it's 6.7 billion mobile subscriptions in the world, it's roughly 200 million that has 4G. Mm -hmm. The majority still have 2G, GPRS, and 3G. And of course, if you want to start building applications, services, and scale them globally, you need to understand the technology and the networks under them. And that's why in, the, in this relationship, we're also building uh, a lab inside the, the Facebook where you can, you can try out a 2G network, how it works in India, where you have a 2G network with GPRS, or you have a 3G network in Indonesia, how that will work and, and your app, how that will perform. And even then giving advice how you can optimize the application or the services. And that's what we're doing. We're doing it with them. But at the same time, any smartphone producer in the world, they would come to our smartphone lab mm -hmm. uh, to test their phones before they go out in the market. We roughly have 50% of all 4G traffic in the world is going through our equipment. So of course, if we come with a new phone, you test it with us. So I think that's where we find our role in this sort of ecosystem, because it's much more about partnering with different, uh, different uh, entities when you go into this a new world where you need to scale these solutions. So Facebook obviously makes sense that you know, they've, they've saturated certain markets at this point, and to connect the next billion to Facebook, um, they need to look elsewhere in the globe. Are there yeah. other Silicon Valley companies, app developers, software companies that you're actively working with that are also at that stage? Yeah, of course. We are working with many of Ooh. them. Yeah, yeah, of course. They are an important player on top of the networks. Of course, we need to understand each other when it comes to designing the networks and what type of application you have and how heavy they are and how we can optimize them. Because finally, it's all about giving a consumer experience, a service. And then you need both the understanding of the network and the application. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to understand when we now are going into the next phase and by 2019, it's going to be 8 billion mobile broadband subscriptions. 
That means that we're almost going to have three times as many people on this earth having access to internet in five years. Mm -hmm. So of course, and many of them will of course start with some type of connected device. There will not be a colored TV, a laptop, computer, that projection will never happen. They will start with a connected device. So, of course, that becomes very relevant when you have these discussions. And is that a model that you think, though, will, will work with other companies um, setting up these kind of co-labs co together? Yeah, in our case, we spend five billion US dollars a year in research and development. And uh, uh, so, of course, for us to understand who is going to use the networks in the future, what type of demands is going to be there is enormously important. Of course, we work with our customers. Uh, which is predominantly uh, operators, but we work with many others to understand what requirement do we need when we design 5G or 4G. And just to understand, we started to design 4G LTE probably some 15 years ago. That's when we started to do research. And 3G was probably 20 years ago. And of course, we've been working for a couple of years. How do we believe 5G will look like? Mm -hmm. That's going to be exciting, huh? <laughs> yeah, for us, it's super exciting. Uh, <laughs> Well, it, your, your industry has changed a lot, and the, the competitive landscape is very different. Um, the, the technologies, obviously, are different. Can you talk a bit about, and we chatted about this earlier, but just the need from your perspective. I mean, I get Facebook's need to yeah. expand, but what's the need from your perspective to work with those kind of players today? No, I think that, again, I mean, it's very much about to understand what type of new innovation it will be on top of the networks. Uh, because they have, they have to be the both. I mean, the network has to be being able to handle all the different type of application. And you can take examples that if you look out five years, we need probably to design mobile networks that send a very low power radio signal so you can change the battery every 10 years on some type of devices. At the same time, you want to go from connected cars to connected transport systems, which means that you need to bring down the latency enormously in the network if you want to auto-steer cars. So those are two use cases where you need to think when you do research right now and, and when you start designing the next generation networks. So one would be the automotive industry, another would be the light poles that we're working with, for example, where we want to get them connected. So all of that, uh, puts in a lot of information for us to design this and, of course, scale it worldwide. Mm -hmm. As we're in 180 countries and the greatness of our industry that is now merging with many others is that we sell the same mobile infrastructure equipment to New York as to Nairobi. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same mobile phone that works in New York works in Nairobi. And that is enormous scale. And that's why we have 6.7 billion mobile subscriptions today. And by 2019, 90% of the Earth's population above six years will have a phone. Mm -hmm. Think about that. But it's coming because we, we're using the same technology. We're getting an enormous scale, which can transform a lot in our society. Yeah, another way that your uh, company has, has changed, um, you've gotten into the services business, obviously, um, and you have divested yourselves of the phone business, yeah. even though they got James Bond to use Sony Ericsson devices, which is a, a pretty good accomplishment there. But can you talk a bit about your decision to do that? Because that was under your, your watch. We basically had a 10-year plan from 2010 and onwards where we, we basically saw this change. And just to, we believe it's, this is the fifth technology revolution we're into, IT, telecoms, internet. Um, and we knew also that we were coming out from the first phase of that technology revolution. And that phase was where we built all the networks in the world with one single service, and that was voice. Remember, we built everything, all this, for one single service that you can talk to each other. The only thing we found out, that's the smallest service there's going to be in the networks. And of course, that revolution is now happening. And of course, many of you sitting in this room, you're representing that revolution. You're coming in in the second phase of the technology revolution and start adding a lot of value to the networks. And so when we realized that and looked into our trajectory, we said, where are we going to play? Where are we going to be in the number ones of the world? Mobile infrastructure was clear. We are number one. We are twice the size of number two in that. But we also saw a growing need for services, everything from outsourcing networks to integrated. And then we saw that all the IT system also need to be changed. And TV and media is coming into this. So TV and media. IT as well as telecom is coming in. So that's where I bet. So we betted on TV and media. We're doing 
a lot of investment in TV and media, mm -hmm. and billing system, and then we're mobile infrastructure, and then we glue that together with our services in order to see that we can actually be relevant for the next 10 years as well. And in that whole conglomerate of decisions and resource and capital allocation, phones didn't make it mm -hmm. for us. I mean, it's a totally new device. I mean, in the beginning, when Ericsson started with phones, we sold the network, and our customer told us, we cannot buy the network, we don't have any phones. So we need to start doing phones as well. That's how we started. Today, we all know that phones is something totally different. Mm -hmm. It's a design product, it's cool and everything, and it's detached from the, from the network. And we felt that our competence in our company, our 114,000 employees, we are much better in other things, and that was a decision. What, what, and by the way, I want to open up to questions soon, so please be ready. Um, what, in, in your view, has been the, the problem, the challenge in the phone business, and why so many companies we've seen just rise and fall in, uh, over the course of just a few years? You know, I, I've always had simple theories. I think we used to are in, in the second phase of the technology revolution. We that did the phones in the beginning, we did it for one reason, for voice. That's, we, we were in the first phase, building voice, because that we thought. Of course, the ones coming in the second phase, they thought about the phone as something totally different. Mm -hmm. And I think that transformation is very hard. Uh, and that's why we joined with Sony and made Sony Ericsson, which, of course, Sony came from that content-rich uh, mm -hmm. device, etc. cetera. Uh, and then lately, of course, we sold it to Sony as well. So I think, again, it's for me, is a, it's logical what has happened. Hmm. Um, I want to ask you about China. Um, you actually, personally, you lived in China and worked there for Ericsson for a while early on, right? Yes. Just for a little bit of time. What was that experience like? Uh, it was in the beginning of my career. I, I probably had made one month at Ericsson before they sent me to China. So, and and, uh, it and was they shipped a, you off. I, it was the first time I actually left Sweden without my parents as well. So it was a. So his father so, is a police officer. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, I guess my experience was pretty tough, but I learned uh -huh. a lot. And tough of course, in what way? Yeah, I mean, language-wise, it's tough. Uh, I and this was in 1992. Yeah, right? and it, we. We were very few expats, etc. So, of course, it was tough, but it was also the beginning of building GSM. Ericsson built a fantastic platform and a, a, a very big market share in China during that time. So, I think it was all benefits. But I remember when I come home, came home and I said that, you send me somewhere I can learn the language because I didn't manage to learn Chinese. <laughs> all right, um, fast forward to today. Um, you obviously have operations in, in China, but you have a relatively small market share. And on the flip side, you've got Huawei coming into Europe and other territories where you've traditionally played a, a you know, pretty big role and um, gobbling up market share. This is, a very, this is your top competitor, right? Um, and they're obviously going into the services business as well. How do you tackle a competitor like Huawei and what are some of the unique challenges that they represent to the industry today? If you look at the company, first of all, I mean, we are in so many different areas. So of course, in some areas, we, we meet our way as the main competitors, but that didn't happen yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been competing with them for 15 years. So it's nothing new. And as I said before, we, we are twice the size of number two in the industry. We fight every day to be the technology leader in the world when it comes to mobile technology. Uh, we have increased our R&D investments in order to stay ahead. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how we compete. Uh, a great company that done well. I mean, if you go back to 20, 2002, we can actually line up 15 competitors in mobile infrastructure. And they would be the Nortel, the Motorola's, uh, Marconi's, Philips, name them. And if you look today. Some of them are gone. I, I would say there's basically two mergers, uh -huh. Alcatel Lucent and uh, Nokia, Nokia Siemens, and then it's Chinese. So basically 13 companies has vanished in a time of 10 years. So we have already been into this uh, transformation right. as needed. So you just need to but do be they, focused. Do, and, and it's been, I'm sure, a, a cutthroat industry for years and years. Yeah. But do they, uh, in light of some of their recent wins over the last few years, especially in, in, in the European market, for example, um, do they represent a different kind of competitor for you today? than some of the former? No, we need to have respect for all our competitors. I mean, we have 114,000 employees, and if I ask them who is the main competitor uh, for you, I would get different answers. I would get from a service crew, it would be much more the Accenture of the world, the IBMs and the HPs. If I talk my billing system, they would talk a lot about Amdocs, uh, Oracle, etc. cetera. Uh, mobile infrastructure would talk about Huawei. So it's more about these are the 
combine assets where we're going to compete. Uh, no one has uh, have the same assets, so of course we need to have a good understanding or competition. But uh, okay, but just between you and me. Is oh. it, no, okay. <laughs> okay. You will not say anything. Negative. No, okay. but uh, can, can you here? Let me phrase this another way. Um, is there some reason that a company like Facebook or any other software company developer should work with you versus going to Huawei and working with them? Um, is there something about your company, the technology, the IP, the innovation, the culture? that you think is different? Yeah, there are a couple of things. I mean, culture we can always debate, but I think we have a great culture in the company, which is a global culture, by the way. Uh, first of all, we are having the majority of all the patterns in the world on 2G, 3G, and 4G. So of course, we are the, uh, the leading innovator. We are having, as I said, 50% of all the traffic on LTE. Uh, we are on the most advanced markets. We, of course, are twice the size of number two. So I guess mm -hmm. if you want to test out and work with a company that are global in 180 countries, having mobile networks with all the operators all around the world, I guess I, I would go to us, but I, I, <laughs> I might be biased, who knows? Um, I want to <laughs> take the opportunity to open up to questions from the audience, and there should be microphones going around. Does anybody have a question for Hans that they'd like to ask? Just raise your hand. Don't all jump at once. <laughs> all right, I'm going to ask you another question then, and please think um, we can call on people too. You feel free to call on people. Um, you mentioned 5G, obviously, and I think uh, there's a lot of interest because we're always interested in the next big thing and faster and better and all of that. But you've, you've also said that 5G won't be just an extension of 4G like 4G was of 3G and, and so on. How is it different? I mean, if you look from 2G to 3G, it was a big step change uh, in many senses. Uh, but it was one thing that was similar. We increased the speed, and we increased, the, increased sort of the, uh, the robustness of the technology. We went to 4G, basically did the same. Both the speed and the coverage and the quality increased. You made it like this. If you now think in the future in 10 to 15 years out, our society is not, it's going to be a lot of consumers using the networks. It's going to be a lot of industries that's going to be transformed by using mobility broadband and the cloud. You can think about the automotive industry, you can think about the transport industry, the software industry will use this. Of course, they will come with other requirements. And finally, the society will also be transformed. Think about healthcare systems using this, think about education systems using this. Think about fighting CO2 emissions using this. Mm -hmm. So of course, when you think about all those use cases that historically has been a consumer that use more bandwidth and more speed, uh, we're going to get different use cases. And you need to slice networks that actually can know the different type of uh, users. I mean, think about the remote patient that you are following. Uh, that's extremely important that you know it's a remote patient and maybe not uh, uh, a connected car or something like that. And over time, they will have different requirements of quality of service. Um, and if we listen around with all our customers and all the big enterprises of the world and our society, that will be a lot of new requirements because the technology will be so important for transforming and making things much better. So I think that that's how we see 5G. It will build on 4G. It will be standardized so we can bring down the cost. Because finally, I mean, today, for every $10, you can reduce the, price, the average price of a smartphone in the world. More than 100 million people can buy it. And there's a reason for that, because we sell the same phones with the same frequencies and the same technologies inside them. Mm -hmm. So of course, that is the next step to see that we can have different type of quality of service depending on users in the 5G network. And that's going to be everything from healthcare to education to uh, connected cores. Uh, you've, got, you've got a, a, a project also, or a pilot, I guess, with Philips to yeah. connect. Can you explain what that is? Because I, I, my understanding is they're basically like Connected light poles light with poles. small cells. And what else do you tack on? And one of the biggest challenges we have in big cities, I mean, think about 2050, 70% of the Earth's population will be in cities. Mm -hmm. That will require totally new infrastructure, or you're, you build three times as much infrastructure. And that's not possible. So what you need to do, you need to use technology. One of the most biggest challenges you have in, in big cities is to densify the network. Uh, so you get the better customer experience, the data loads, and all of that. And you cannot get big sites anymore in big cities. So 
what we are doing with Philips, which are changing the light poles in order to bring down the uh, CO2 emission as well as uh, the bill for electricity in the cities. Mm -hmm. We are mounting inside those light poles small radio base stations. To can we get a few of those for the Fortune headquarters in New York, by yeah, the way? Yeah, we, we can debate I, that. that be... <laughs> uh, we can debate that. that would be but we're trying that in the U.S. first, and we, we think it's, it's, it's a good way of combining industries. Uh -huh. Think again. I mean, Philips, Ericsson, it has to be a, a city mayor, and of course, it has to be an operator. Those four need You're to come together to get that together. Is that Yeah. Okay. So, so then you need to get that together. Was there a question out in the audience? Can you just say your name and company? My, I can't see where. With MIT. When one looks at Ericsson's assets, when one looks at your growth, when one looks at your being in an infrastructure business, which is traditionally low margin, it seems as if you don't have much choice but to grow as much through acquisition as organically. One, do you agree with that statement? And number two, what kind of value-added service providers do you need to partner with so you can be more than spending more and more and more competing in a very tough, low-margin infrastructure business? I think that in the core areas, uh, like in infrastructure, uh, the growth rate is somewhere between 3 to 5% a year the next three years. So you're absolutely right, in dollars as well. So, so you're right. Here, we are investing basically organically own R&D, so that's how we do it. Then in the new areas, or the target areas, everything from OSS, BSS, building system, TV and media, here of course we're acquiring companies very much focused on the uh, companies that are adding to our portfolio, strengthening our position. And these are large acquisitions, right? I mean, you've made a couple <laughs> they, of... They have been medium-sized and oh. some larger. I mean, Telcordia was one, Media Room from, uh, from Microsoft, one another. Uh, we bought Red B. We are now running uh, probably some 300 TV channels in Europe outsourced to us. So we are mm -hmm. running the TV station and we want to be the number one from ingestion of content to the play out to any type of device. Everything in between that we want to take as well. And we think it's a, a combination of telecoms and TV and media because the majority of everything in the networks going forward will actually be some sort of video. So that's why we believe uh, that area is, is very sort of uh, aligned and adjacent to what we're doing. So you're right, we are looking into these areas to see that we're, we are going forward as a company. But you need to think about the company for 137 years. We've been around for 137 years. We have changed all the time in order to be relevant. That's the only way for us to be around. Uh, we will continue to do that. So I, I think that's uh, uh, the way. But the networks will just be more important going forward because they're going to be used even more and more broadly all around the world. So. That's nothing we want to leave. We think it's a very important platform for the whole society and for Ericsson. How big of a, of, of a percentage do you expect your services side of the business to get, though? It's at 43% now, is that right? Uh, when we started in 2003, we, we turned over two and a half billion US dollars. When I started, I was the head of global services. Last year, in some type of currency transformation here, uh, we turned over 15 billion US dollars. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it's an enormous transformation in the company, and think also about in the beginning of 2000, roughly 75% of all our revenues was hardware, 25% was software and services. Last year, it was the total reverse. 75% mm -hmm. was software and services, 25% was hardware. And then we, we turn over yeah, somewhere 35 billion US dollars. So it's an enormous change from a revenue point of view, but think about all the people we have to change and the, how many factories we have taken out mm -hmm. that we don't need anymore because we're in a totally different business. Or indeed, engineers are doing software, not hardware. Yeah. Uh, question back there. Hi. Hi, Joe Marchese with Truex. I just had a question on the content and bandwidth. So you talked about the phone coming first, and I'm assuming you lump tablets into that as well. Yep. And as people are in increasingly watching more video content, HD, uh, yeah. the content consumption usage is increasing. Is there a horizon where mobile could replace the pipe into the home? Because that seems to be a major bandwidth constraint, or do you think that doesn't happen? It, if you, first of all, I mean, if you put yourself in, in a global perspective, in many countries in the world, there's not going to be any wires. <laughs> so, so, of course, if we if you look at a country like US or Sweden, there's going to be fiber, there's going to be a lot of that infrastructure that you're going to work with in order to make the most efficient delivery. I think that the majority of all the last mile or the, 
the connectivity is going to be wireless somehow. Uh, but in many cases, it's only going to be wireless because the wire line is not even there. Uh, in, if you take uh, Africa, for example, and, and uh, parts of Asia. So uh, definitely. And if you look at the technologies, I mean, 2G to 3G was probably 10 times smarter, meaning handling frequencies. 3G to 4G was 10 times smarter again, meaning how we can handle a lot of data. And then you add to that new features, everything like load balancing, carry aggregation, a uh, lot of fancy words, but very important for being able to handle frequencies. Uh, then you can actually handle quite a lot of data loads going forward. Our estimation is that data in the, mo in the networks will grow with 10 to 12 times every year going forward. We think we can handle that with those technology shifts as well as some new frequencies that have to come out in the lower ranges. And that will only increase the speed, of course, in the networks. Any other questions from the audience? There's a hand back there. I think you're getting a microphone. Can you introduce yourself, Rob? Hi, Rob Tander from Qualcomm, and I'm actually not going to ask a radio question. Because um, <laughs> I'm a software guy. So one of the things that I think is really fascinating, I think a lot of people don't know, is some of the work that was done at Ericsson early with Erlang and how that's actually influenced companies like WhatsApp yeah. and Secret and other things. Do you see er, um, Ericsson playing that role of a platform provider and maybe be able to take more of the value this time around in either software-defined networking or, or something of the like? Uh, clearly, we, we are very much in, in, in that area of both uh, virtualization of our products. When we started in 2010, uh, we started for a long time ago, but we had probably some 30, 40 different hardware platforms. We're down to three right now. We probably have equally many software stacks. We're down to very few. Basically, by next year, we can virtualize any product in a portfolio except the radio because the radio we haven't found any efficiency on. Of course, we're seeing that that platform and that virtualization will play a vital role for Ericsson going forward. And, uh, and being part of the whole orchestration of the software-defined networks going forward. And that combined with the mobile networks will, of course, bring a lot of efficiencies. But more important, it will bring quicker services, smarter services to consumers and enterprises. And that's what we're seeing happening in the next five to 10 years. So you're absolutely right. We are planning to play a vital role in hold that chain. Doesn't every company want to be a platform today, right? That's the new, I don't know. The new product. Okay. Um, any, other, any other questions from the audience? Please uh, here, raise your hand. One. Adam. Hi, Adam Lashinsky with Fortune Magazine. Hans, could you briefly remind everybody about um, what Ericsson did with its cell phone business and talk a little bit about how that process went? And then lastly, <laughs> are you pleased to be out of the hand of the cell phone business? <clears throat> uh, the two things. Emotionally, I think it was one of my tougher decisions. I mean, Ericsson has had some kind of a phone since Lars Magnus founded the company in 1976. So of course, we decide that we don't are into any type of handsets, fixed or uh, PBXs or, or mobile phones, was a big emotional decision. Logically uh, and strategically, it was pretty simple. I mean, the whole world changed so dramatically quickly on the handset side. Uh, the device became something totally different that we envisioned from the beginning. Uh, so I think that was pretty, pretty clear. The other was, of course, that. Uh, when you have a 50-50 joint venture, you always need to think who can buy the 50% that you have. And I guess uh, that took me some two years to, to work through. <laughs> and then finally, Sony picked it up. But uh, so of course, it was a, a process that was pretty cumbersome. But on the other hand, I think that looking back on 10 years of a joint venture between a Japanese consumer product company and an Ericsson that's an engineering company, I think it was brilliant thought from the beginning for. To be, I wasn't even there, so I have nothing to do with it. Thinking that Sony and Ericsson would do handsets together. And I think that the company was hugely successful during the 10 years, if you combine them. Had some really tough years in 2008 and 9. Came back 10, 11. Uh, beginning was fantastic. So I think that if I look back on it, it was absolutely the right decision. But I still believe it was the right decision to leave. Well, things, things seem, th seem to change so rapidly, so maybe they'll get back into the phone business at some point in the next few years, right, if it makes sense. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. I really want to thank you, especially for coming all the way from Stockholm um, to Aspen. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you thank so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.